and everyone should now receive a message that the recording has started. That's right, right? Yeah. So now I can go back to um, to my presentation here, and then we can we can start. So once more, welcome everyone. Um, today we have a busy uh, busy agenda. Um, in more roughly the first hour. Uh, of the one and a half hour that we have today, we will explain you um, something about the STASH project, about the status, status of the project and the STASH open standard that we have developed. And we finalize this with a presentation uh, from Werner about the first applications of the standard um, in, uh, in a fuel cell module that is STASH, uh, that is built according to the STASH um, uh, conditions. Um, and uh, we try to finish this in uh, one hour so that we have a half an hour of Q&A left and which you can ask all your questions that you that you want. Um, so a few words about why STASH. Um, the first thing to realize is that always the question is why did you choose this abbreviation STASH? Uh, STASH is, uh, means uh, standardized sized heavy duty hydrogen. It means that we are developing a standard, an open standard for fuel cell modules in which we define um, the sizes and also the interconnections. Um, I think it may very well be known by now that hydrogen is, uh, well, maybe in the heavy duty sector, um, one of the major means to decarbonize the transport sector. Um, but what we have seen in the past from all the projects that have been executed so far, is that uh, the majority of the fuel cell systems that have been built for these applications are custom made, and uh, hence um, this is uh, difficult to reach uh, economics of scale if we believe that um, the market should grow. So we would really like to decrease the cost and to create a environment in which, in theory, you can replace one stack, one fuel cell module with the other. Um, so. Um, the objectives of, um, of our project are, are clear. Uh, we try to kickstart the adoption of fuel cells in the heavy duty sector. And um, with creating an open standard, we are trying to lower the R&D uh, cost for OEMs. We can pull demand um, from different markets together and create scalability. Um, clearly also um, it helps uh, that uh, automation processes can be, can be well, more tuned towards a particular size. And that we most importantly improve, uh, can now improve also the supply chain and create a fair competition um, among the suppliers, all to lead to lower TCO for the end users. And this is what we try to achieve. Um, we are currently in a partnership of uh, 22 partners. Um, nine of them are OEMs, eight of them are fuel cell module suppliers, and five. Um, of our partners are uh, research, test, and engineering and knowledge institutes. Um, how does our project uh, look like? Uh, roughly, roughly, our project is divided in three blocks. Uh, the first block, we are developing the standard uh, based on uh, inputs from all the different partners. Now, this part is now X is now done, is, is, has ended. Um, and uh, that means that the second phase of the project has started in which we are going to develop um, the full fuel cell modules that adhere to the standard. This is currently ongoing. And in the last step, these fuel cell modules uh, will be tested. Uh, currently, preparatory works are ongoing to make that happen once the first uh, fuel cell modules are ready to be tested. And in the last step, we are trying to update uh, the developed standard based on uh, the experience that we have gained during the development and the testing of the standards of the, of the fuel cell modules. So um, your point of contact, uh, Federico Seinit is our uh, coordinator. So he will be your first main of, main point of contact for the project. But um, for any activities related to dissemination of exploitation, um, I am able to be your contact. Um, and hence also you have been invited through me today um, for this first exploitation uh, workshop. Um, Good to mention also is that um, this project is funded by the Fuel Cells and Hydrogen Joint Undertaking. Now it is called the Clean Hydrogen Partnership. Um, so that means that we are receiving co-funding from this uh, undertaking and hence also from the European Union. So 
um, this is the introduction for um, for what I have to present. Um, I'm now going to sh stop sharing the screen um, and hence I will give the floor to Ruth to um, be the first presenter of the day um, about um, yeah about the the first part, which is the sizing of um, of of uh, the fuel cell modules and um, yeah the process that we have um, worked upon to to reach that. Um, so once Ruth is able to, yeah, Ruth, the floor is uh, floor is yours. You see something? Yeah, it is feasible. Thank you very okay. much. Okay. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm Ruth Bon. I'm working at VDL. I'm responsible for new technologies, and I have a long history in hydrogen. My first hydrogen vehicle was made in 1998. And during the last 25 years, we made a lot of vehicles on hydrogen, not only those ones which you see here, not only buses and trucks, but also uh, automated guided vehicles and containers. But the big problem we had in the last 25 years is that every time uh, there was a new fuel cell from an other supplier or from the same supplier, and every time the fuel cell was different, and every time we had to re engineer the total vehicle or the total application and that looked uh, was uh, as user of fuel cell that was a lot of work to, uh, that if even a fuel cell would would improve a little bit so after some years we had to make a new vehicle and so we thought about to make a standard that we can use it as a lego block take out the fuel cell put a new one in and even when the fuel cell becomes better in the years that the outside will be the same and also uh, let's say the connection areas would be almost the same i know this is a very difficult uh, way to do because i knew also from the battery and everybody knows the aa battery that took 40 years before that became its standard i hope this will be shorter maybe uh, five years and we do it very well but it is very difficult to get everybody on the standard. Now, uh, as uh, discussed in this, uh, on this slide, it is not only for vehicles. We use it in uh, more than one application, but it can be used in all applications you can imagine. And uh, as Stash is say saying, it is uh, almost only for heavy duty. That was the main purpose. We know that if you use a fuel cell in a small car, then it would be difficult to put such a big box in a car. But we see the fuel cell market also for the heavy duty market and the long distance. Um, for the rest, uh, uh, we use, um, let's say in the beginning, a lot of sizes are made as worst case sizes. And uh, at the end, the one thing before I start with the rest of the presentation, we had in, uh, in the beginning, we called everything HH with a little A. Now we call it A like a battery, AA and so on. So the, the terminology is a little bit changed. So I have a table of contents with five different contents. One first, the, the total or, uh, overall size. Let's say first with the key terminology. So what is what? How uh, does a fuel cell module look like? And what do we expect to, with, to be within the size? And then the size definition, where uh, would be the, the best optimal places to put the connection area? What connections do we have? And what are overall requirements like uh, lifetime and so on? And we use also a lot of European key performance indicators. And at the end, uh, Henrik of Synthef will talk about uh, the communication between the fuel cell and the rest of the equipment of the application. Now, first, uh, the standard size key terminology, and that's what do we as expect to be within the module we are speaking later of. And what we thought is that everything will be in the module except the big parts. And the big parts are, the, of course, the hydrogen storage, the cooling system, 
uh, let's say the radiator and uh, fans. The air filters, because also filters you don't want to have in the box, because filters you have to change every now and then, so it is better to have it outside of the box. Then, of course, uh, the exhaust system would be outside, and of course, if it is used in any application, and in this case it is called vehicle control, but it can be any application, the control will be outside. So the control will give only the information, I want to have so many kilowatts and inside the module, everything is controlled inside. Then uh, there is some yeah, optional, we can you have the DC-DC inside the box, but it can be also outside. So this is not uh, mandatory and uh, some, Fuel cell suppliers make the DC-DC inside, some do it outside, but both is possible in this standard. And at the end, the minimum requirement should be that it is more than 30 kilowatts in the beginning of life. That, uh, the, and like I said, the optional fuel, the DC-DC inside or outside. So there should be already a lot in the box. And I know from all my projects the last 25 years that all those things were at this moment delivered separately, which gives a, a lot of work and a lot of re-engineering for the, the persons and the factories who uh, use the fuel cell but doesn't uh, develop them. Second uh, point, the standard size definition. So. With uh, what we just said is I want to have, let's say, almost all things in the box and only the big things outside and the filters. And what would the box look like then? Now, we defined in this project three boxes, the A, the B and the C box. And the A, the B and the C box, the difference are the length. So the A box is one meter and 20 millimeters. The B box is 340 millimeters longer and the C box again. So the C box is one meter 70. And the width is for every box the same and the height can be 340, 680 or 1020. So let's say for the A it is 340, for the double A it is 680. And this is a little bit strange in batteries. When you have more A's, it becomes smaller. In our case, a bit more A's, it becomes bigger. Now, we have also some tolerances. It should be always smaller. And why should it be always smaller? If you are, in, uh, if you use it uh, as uh, OEM or something, and uh, the box is suddenly 100 millimeters bigger, it doesn't fit anymore. When it is smaller, it fits because I have always enough room because I were I made my application on the maximum size of this stash. Some examples, why is chosen for these uh, sizes? No. For example, uh, we see that the truck was a worst case size. Let's say on a ship or on a train, normally you have more space so we looked at one of the worst cases and there are some of them so let's say that we have for example in a truck on the side where the tanks are on the side of the chassis le left and right the maximum size is like the a so the a size is a little bit the uh, the current diesel tank size of a uh, uh, truck the B size is a little bit the engine size of a truck. And then you have the double B is the for smaller truck and the triple B is even uh, the bigger truck. And what you can see here also is that the B is, um, let's say, looks more, the size of the B version looks like a diesel engine. And so also the B version can be used in ships or in generator sets where at this moment are also uh, diesel engines used. The C version, and I go back for that, is uh, a bigger one, but more flat. And this one, uh, the main uh, applications are on the roof of a vehicle, like a bus, or under a trailer. 
where we don't have where we have enough place but not the height and so we have for all three sizes we looked at the worst case and uh, now one uh, it is also uh, optional for the fuel cell supplier but it is not mandatory again that you can use it in two sites and for example, uh, Werner will tell you more about the fuel cell they developed, and we use already the fuel cell in two applications, one in a truck at the place where the fuel tank would be, that's the lower picture, and one in a container as in genset, but then we have put the same module vertical. There are a lot of other applications where we said from for, for this application you can use the A, the B or the C or only the B or only the C. And this you have to look later and you can find this also on the internet, but I don't tell you everything. But like I said before, the B is more the diesel engine variant, the C is for under the roof or under the floor, and the A is more like the fuel tank size. So. Uh, and then you can see if I use it on the road, if I use it on the stationary or on the water, I can use a lot of different uh, sizes. And of course, one of the uh, one of the project uh, ideas is that you can also combine more than one fuel cell together. So we asked in the stash project that these modules could be uh, coupled up to one megawatt if necessary maybe in a container on genset for ships or something like that. So the modules must uh, be uh, capable to couple to maximum one megawatt. And that can be, for example, if a BB has 200 kilowatts, that there will be five of them. When it is only 50 kilowatts, you need 20 of them. And but and, uh, well, that's one of the parts of the project. Then we came to the most difficult part, which gave also the most uh, discussions the last year. That's where should be the connection area. Now, then I go first to the picture because that's easier to explain than to the text. And the text is the same as what I'm now explaining. Here you have, for example, the A size, the small A size, which is about uh, one meter by 70 centimeters by 340 in height. And there we said the connection area could be on the long side or on the small side of the box. Only the long side of uh, the box, we said this is this could be a very long side. At C, in the C version, this is one meter 70. And we don't want to have the whole long side connection area. So we said if the connection area is on the long side, it must be maximum 340 millimeters. When the connection area is on the short side, which is in this case 700 millimeters, and for all 700 millimeters, you can use it the whole side or only partially the side. And that you can see in the pictures above in the middle. I use the whole side, 700, and on the picture next to it, to the right, you can see I use only partly the side. At the end, there was also a lot of discussions to use two sides, uh, on the long side and on the, the small side together. And the idea was to have, for example, when you have a truck, or another application that you have on one side, you have your tanks and everything, and in the other side, you have uh, your cooling system. And after a lot of discussions, we said, yeah, this is possible. You can use two sides, but if you use two sides, all the hydraulic and air connections should be doubled, so on both sides. Uh, so if you have on one side, the let's say, hydraulic and uh, Air, that should be also on the other side. So you can always choose on what side you will use it. And also at the last point, there was also a lot of discussions where to put the high voltage and the low voltage. And at the end, 
we said that it was, you can put it anywhere. And this gave a lot of discussions before, but if we put it in these connection areas, it could be very difficult. And to make an extra cable to another side is not a big problem. So we decided to have the electricity connection. You can choose where you want to have it. And only the hydraulics and the pneumatic connections are in the two connection areas which are defined here. I put it all uh, also uh, what I just said in, in some tables, but this you can read later more uh, in detail. And uh, but it says the same. So we have the first uh, that we have it on the small and on the long side that we have uh, different depths de depending on the, which uh, part of the connection site is the main part of the connection site now. And we said also that both positions can be used, but also the pneumatic and hydraulic connections must be redundant. And at the, uh, let's see, the first, uh, yeah. yeah, it is about the depth, how you want to have it. and. Some people said I can't make them the uh, the same depth on both sides because then I lose too much space. And so for this, you can make one depth should be the depth defined and the other one can be smaller. And that is uh, discussed in this slide. Then we come to the definition of the connections itself. So the connections in the connection area, we say the connections should be uh, they can be put in the interface on any position the positions are not defined if they are inside the connection area but what we defined is the 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 connection principle let's say uh, if we use a hose for uh, air i don't know then it should be for all a hose even the hose can be bigger or smaller depending on the uh, power the module gives. And so we defined that for uh, ranges of power, we say the air should be, for example, in host, the cooling should be this and so on and so on. And we put that all together again in a table. And there you can see that, for example, we use for the air, which I used as example, the nozzle plus a hose. And for less than 70 kilowatts, it should be 30 to 60 millimeters. For 70 to 100 kilowatts, it should be somewhere between 45 and 75 millimeters, and so on. And there are also, uh, let's say, some optional things. For example, the cooling for the electronics could be outside. If there's no DC DC inside and there's only a small electronics inside, then this connection is an optional connection. And also this is for the breather and even if you need to have ventilation. Another requirement is if you have the fuels of the, all the connection, the connection should be in vertical and in horizontal way not interfering. And you see the picture below on the left side where uh, we can have it in vertical of in, in both direction, X and Y, uh, not interfering with the other ones. And the picture above, you get, could see a possible application for this, so that we put five of them next to each other, five modules, and then we can connect them with uh, one pipe or uh, from one side to another side. This is only an example which is used and only to uh, give an idea what is meant by that we will not uh, that we will not have interfering connections. At the end, I'm coming to the overall requirements. They are not so much. There are three kinds of general requirements, which you can see in the table, which where we say it should be uh, working uh, up to 3,000 meters with 50,000 hours a minimum. Uh, and uh, an IP class of 54. 
and that's one of the general requirements but these are all general requirements because most of the requirements you can find back in standard norms and they are now in uh, they are now worked out in work package uh, six of the stash requirements and there uh, we are looking to all kinds of standard and norms for all kinds of applications like trucks buses ships trains at this moment, they are very different, and we try to get some, uh, let's say, common uh, requirements for all kinds of applications. So if someone builds a module for a truck, that can be used also on a ship, for example. And uh, otherwise, it, uh, you are, are still building for ships different ones as for trucks, as for trains, and then the standard becomes only a standard for one application, and that's not the the let's say the that's that's not what we want to achieve in this project at last there are a lot of key performance indicators they are uh, you can find them in the clean hydrogen joint undertaking the, and they uh, give you all kinds of ideas uh, on what it should be and for example i took it out of this uh, document and there you can see that they have KPIs for heavy duty vehicles, KPIs for maritime, they have KPIs for trains, for aviation and stationary application. And one very important thing, this is also made together with the people from STASH in Europe. And also in this report, you can read that in the future, the clean hydrogen uh, Europe wants to uh, uh, let's say promote the stash requirements on the next uh, uh, subvention calls, uh, funding funding calls. So it looks very important also for Europe, and Europe sees also a kind of standard, like uh, Michael said, to upgrade the let's say the production of the fuel cells, especially with all suppliers, and that they can because everyone has the same standard, can uh, optimize the production, make mass production, and at the end, reduce the price per kilowatt to uh, the required, in this case, 100 euro per kilowatt in 2030. Now, now I come to the API definitions, but that will be done by Henrik. Thank you. Yeah, thanks so much, Ruth, for uh, the presentation. Um, indeed, uh, as you were saying, this is a first effort that has been ever performed worldwide to come to such a uh, standard. Um, if, if you could stop uh, sharing, Ruth, and uh, then can uh, yeah. um, uh, Hendrik can uh, can take it over. So, in terms of uh, module uh, development, uh, we have uh, three uh, three different parts. Ruth has shown you now the uh, the sizes, um, the um, the conditions uh, for uh, the physical connections, and now Hendrik will present something about uh, the digital uh, connections in the standard. So, Hendrik, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you. So um, my name is Henrik Lundqvist. I work at Sintef and uh, I've been coordinating uh, this uh, work on the uh, digital part of the standard. So, yeah. And uh, we, here we call it uh, API definition, but uh, in principle, it's a bit uh, broader than just an API. So. Uh, what we have uh, specified is first uh, what information to send between the fuel cell module and the application ECU, the electronic control unit. And uh, this information then goes uh, both directions. So it's uh, both for control of the fuel cell module and it's for monitoring of the states and the parameters in the fuel cell module. And we have um, tried to fulfill uh, all requirements uh, on safety that uh, are put by different applications uh, to the extent that they uh, should be done from the point of view of the digital interface. And we have also defined uh, a functionality that can be used for diagnostics. 
and then we also look at how to send this information and that includes the data format, the protocols to use and uh, how it's going to be transmitted on a more physical level. And uh, as a principle, we try not to reinvent the wheel, but uh, we try to build upon existing standards to make this uh, more acceptable for the industry to start using it. And uh, we have tried to identify the most suitable standards to build upon. So first we used the CAN bus, since that's uh, used widely in automotive and uh, heavy duty vehicles. We also foresee that it shall be possible to implement the standard uh, over Ethernet. Um, we haven't uh, ex yet uh, defined exactly how to do that. Uh, it would uh, require using uh, IP and some transport protocol. So the details are still uh, left to be defined. So Canvas is basically the main alternative here. And then we also need to look at how to send the information over the Canvas. And here we rely on SAE. SAE J1939, so that's the Society of Automotive Engineers that have defined this uh, standard that is uh, widely used in uh, heavy duty vehicles, among other places. And uh, it uh, includes a lot of uh, different uh, application possibilities, so many different components are supported. And we try to follow the SAE guidelines, which uh, basically say that uh, as far as possible, we shall reuse existing signals rather than define new ones. So for that, this purpose, we model the fuel cell module as a motor generator set and uh, try to reuse those uh, signals and repurpose them for yeah, working with the fuel cell module. So it means we have uh, a subset of the J1939 signals that are used in the STASH standard. And these are described uh, in a text specification that uh, describes how we are using them and what uh, different parameters can are relevant in the STASH standard. And we also have uh, defined a DPC file that uh, can be used uh, for the, to implement this. And uh, some of the signals that we define are mandatory. So typically ones used for control and monitoring like set points and control of state changes. Uh, and then there are a number of optional signals that uh, we have uh, uh, defined that are more used for diagnostics and uh, also, in order to leave some uh, freedom to implement uh, fuel cell modules in different ways, we try not to be too strict on exactly what uh, information should be included, but uh, we also we leave some uh, as optional. And I will say a little bit about the state machine that uh, is uh, used to model how the fuel cell module uh, works. So here we have the, the green boxes are basically control signals that uh, are used to change the states of the fuel cell module. And uh, we have an idle state where the control unit of the fuel cell module is uh, powered. And then uh, you can move to a standby state where more parts of the fuel cell module are powered uh, so that it can quickly move to a state where it is uh, supplying power. So yeah, and that is done through a starting state, which is uh, transitory. And then in the running state, it's uh, delivering power in a, a well-defined manner. And uh, when it's po powering off, it also has a transitory state where it's not well defined what power is really uh, delivered to the uh, output. And 
in addition, we have uh, an error state that can be reached from any other state. And uh, these are main states, and it uh, is designed so that it should be possible to have uh, proprietary substates of those states if that is uh, seen as uh, useful for a specific uh, implementation of a fuel cell module. Uh, we have uh, some uh, uh, decisions to take about uh, specific uh, challenges related to the architecture here. So the first thing uh, is uh, the DC-DC converter as uh, Rude was talking about it can be internal or it can be external to the fuel cell module. In order to make the digital part of the standard more uh, yeah, easy to implement and uh, unitary, we decided that from a logical point of view, we should consider the DC-DC converter as a part of the fuel cell module. And that is even if uh, the fuel cell, the DC DC converter would physically be implemented external to the fuel cell module. And uh, then we also have to look at how to build systems with multiple fuel cell modules. And here we decided to support a principle where we have a, a hierarchy with a primary fuel cell module and secondary fuel cell modules. And in this case, we foresee that the communication between the primary and the secondary fuel cell modules should be using the same protocol that we have defined here. And uh, you can look a little bit on how it would look when we have uh, systems with uh, different uh, fuel number of fuel cell modules. So we have this first alternative uh, implementation where we have uh, primary and secondary fuel cell modules. And in this case, the primary fuel cell module is then responsible for distributing the load between the other fuel cell modules and itself, of course. So it implements the energy management strategy and it also has to act as a, uh, yeah, intermediary node that uh, receives uh, alarms and, and controls the states of the secondary fuel cell modules. We have not uh, specified how the primary fuel cell module shall implement this functionality, so it's up to the implementation to decide how this energy management strategy shall work. I should say that there, there is, of course, also the possibility to implement uh, an application ECU that controls all the fuel cell modules individually as uh, primary fuel cell modules. So in, the, in that case, the, there is more complexity in the application and uh, less uh, in the uh, fuel cell modules. You, you don't need this uh, more complex primary fuel cell module. And uh, moving on, I would say something about the uh, diagnostics. So we have the more uh, basic functionality for alarms and warnings that is implemented using J1939 uh, diagnostic message one. Uh, and we, we don't use other diagnostic messages that are defined in J1939. So the DM1 is uh, defining different trouble codes that uh, uh, can be used to indicate what is going wrong and uh, exactly how this uh, shall be used and interpreted would be up to the manufacturer to define, but we include some guidelines in the standard. Then in addition, we use uh, this unified diagnostic services, UDS, uh, as an additional diagnostic uh, interface protocol. And uh, this is used uh, for on-demand diagnostic information. And uh, this information is then only sent when it's uh, requested by a diagnostic client. So 
the fuel cell module will be a server in this sense and uh, the diagnostic clients can be either a testing tool that may be used for example in a workshop or it may be software implemented in the application system and then the application system can of course relay this information to cloud services for example where an analysis of the diagnostic information can be made and uh, UDFs uh, also includes a lot of uh, different subservices and uh, we only foresee that uh, a subset of these shall be supported so for example to read out data and to update the firmware in the fuel cell module and uh, in addition there are those basic functionalities for session control and uh, security that are supported and uh, we have uh, also discussed a connector and uh, how that uh, should look and we came to the conclusion that uh, we should not uh, specify a single connector because that could lead to locking to a specific supplier so instead we have uh, limit the specification to specify a number of pins that uh, should uh, and could be used so there are yeah five uh, mandatory pins those are related to the con bus and a wake-up signal and an emergency stop then th there are a number of uh, optional uh, pins that uh, can be used and many of them are considered useful so there are some for example the possibility to have a secondary con bus if uh, we want to have a, a primary fuel cell module that connects to the secondary ones it can use this separate uh, secondary con bus uh, yeah and uh, that's uh, uh, what i wanted to say about the standard and then uh, i should also mention that we foresee that the standard will be updated and I think in particular for the digital interface this is uh, something that we do expect some changes and uh, you can find the full standard on online and give the feedback so I will thank you so much Henrik sure. thank you thank you so much um, so we have now closed the session about the standard itself. Um, as uh, Hendrik uh, mentioned correctly, we have made the standard public. It is uh, for your uh, assessment. But what, of course, is um, very interesting is how to see how fuel cell module um, developers are um, going to develop products, prototypes towards uh, the standard. And uh, hence, um, we have uh, on uh, online uh, Werner Rumpel from uh, Plastic Omnium, who will uh, share with us um, their development of their fuel cell module that uh, adheres to the to the um, stash standard. So, Werner, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you, Michelle. So you can hear me. Yes, the microphone is on, camera is on. So hello from Austria. My name is Werner Rumpel and I'm the product manager of Plastic Omnion and responsible for the development of the so-called FCM50. So uh, in this slot, I try to give you an impression how we could handle uh, this yeah, very challenging development. And before any development can be started, we get a lot of requirements from two key stakeholders. So from Stash as one stakeholder and also uh, from h 2 Hall, which is also a European Union funded project. Especially our h 2 Hall partner, VDL, uh, was a great sparing partner for defining the media interfaces, the shape, uh, and also the electrical interface. The, our FCM is uh, intended to be used instead of the tanks on a truck, as you can see over here. This picture has already been shared uh, with uh, Ruth half an hour ago. And uh, 
it should be scalable in steps of 50 kilowatt in order to provide power for a 150 kilowatt fuel cell uh, a power train and also 200 kilowatts for uh, richer truck and tractors. That's the reason why, this, why uh, we decided to go for uh, the size single A. So you can see the dimensions over here around one meter, 70 centimeters and 34 centimeters in height. Um, additional requirements came from VDL and they say they don't want to have access uh, to components uh, that need to be maintained by opening the box. So what we try to do is uh, to attach all uh, components that need to be maintained directly on the box so that it can be accessed from the outside. And we, we always speak about a box. So also the requirement was that we have a closed box uh, with an IP rating of at least 6K6 or 67. I mean, there are two uh, ways of defining the envelope. It can be a closed box or it can also be an open box. And then it really depends on the maturity of the components and an IP level, uh, which uh, design or architecture uh, you prefer. So uh, we made the decision uh, to do a closed box with an IP rating. We also um, implemented an galvanic isolated DC-DC converter in order to isolate the stack from the high voltage bus of the application. Um, especially for scaling up the power in steps of, of this 50 kilowatts, it's much better to use an isolated uh, topology of the DC-DC converter, because otherwise you would get into trouble with the isolation resistance. And the design also was focusing on two uh, installation orientation, the horizontal and the vertical one. Um, additional, very challenging uh, requirement was that we should use one coolant for both the stacks and the electronics, because normal systems, uh, you have a low, a low and a high temperature cooling circle. On this picture, you see the scope of the FCM50 module, especially, uh, you know, uh, what is behind, you know, this, 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 this red marked up uh, 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 rectangle. Uh, we have included all what is needed for driving the cooling system, like the cooling pump, like a, 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 a thermo controlled valve. We do all the conditioning uh, for the cathode loop, except the air filter that is placed outside because it needs to be maintained. It's also very huge, so it's not possible to put it into this box. Um, this DC-DC converter is also within the scope, not just the functional, but also uh, the, um, from the physical point of view. So it is within this box I will present later on. And of course, uh, one our main component needs to be put in a fuel cell module. This is the fuel cell module control system. We call it FCCU because there you find the proprietary operation strategy and also the interface to the vehicle control unit. Or if you think about maintain, uh, predictive maintenance, there's also an interface to do some extended data logging. The safety system is also included in the box. And this was our approach. And if you take a look at this functionality, We have a lot of requirements and for us engineers, it's not so easy, you know, to to come up with a, a, a design in a very easy way. So we play then Tetris, we call it Tetris. And uh, I think uh, the most important uh, Tetris block at the beginning is the PNI diagram, is the e-architecture uh, and also, of course, uh, results of simulation in order to define the parameters uh, of the components that should be used within the box. With this uh, component specification, you have to approach a lot of suppliers. And if you're lucky, you find uh, components on stock that can be used for, for your design, your specific design. Sometimes uh, you have to modify existing components or especially considering this challenging uh, size and with a lot of functionality, sometimes you have to start new developments uh, with potential suppliers. So there are a lot of things to do with a complete uh, team like contracting, purchasing, validation, of course, and of course, uh, engineering. So in parallel, uh, we try to assemble a mock-up with dummy components. Sometimes it's a, a 3D printed part and we build up a benchtop system. 
the benchtop system can also be considered to be a Frankenstein. So it's not in the final shape, but you have access to most of the components in order to validate uh, their function within the system design. After uh, this mock-up is uh, finished and the, and the benchtop is working properly, uh, you go uh, next step, we call it the A sample. You have already seen the A sample installation uh, uh, in two applications. I will show them later on again. But this A sample, of course, is just a proof of concept with some safety validation that it can be used safely in, a, in, a, in an application, final application. And in parallel to that, of course, if you know that the system concept works, you start with the development uh, of the B sample. The B sample for us is considered to be uh, fully validated in terms of safety and performance. Endurance testing uh, is not done yet, but of course, uh, after the safety and performance uh, validation is finished, endurance testing uh, will be done as well. Okay, so long story, short sense. Here is the FCM50 and its key parameters. So uh, we use uh, the EKPO proprietary stack technology because PO has a joint venture with Evan Klinger uh, called EKPO. And therefore, uh, we want to use, of course, uh, this excellent uh, technology. Uh, for our design, uh, we uh, have chosen a double stack uh, configuration. Uh, in order to increase the lifetime. So we really um, put a lot of cells into our module in order to keep the current density very low and which is also um, uh, which also affects uh, the endurance and the lifetime of the module. And for uh, this kind of uh, two stack configuration was power uh, to run it uh, with a low pressure cathode. So to get rid of really high pressure uh, compressors because we want to achieve a lifetime. I mean, here it's mentioned 12,000 hours, but we already know from, from the cathode side, we can do even more than 20,000 hours without any problems. So the power is rated to 50 kilowatts, beginning of life, end of life, uh, 43 kilowatts. We have uh, two different output voltage ranges, uh, one 520 to 850, the second one 280 to 470. So it can also be used uh, for like commercial vehicles. The weight is uh, 230 kilograms, including the DC-DC. It's the dimensions are based on the uh, size A. So uh, the height is well, could be reduced to 330 millimeters. We can use a uh, standard hydrogen that can be found on the refilling station. We got, in, uh, we got a very high best efficiency of the system of 56%. And the ambient operating uh, range is also in between minus 25 and 45 degrees. IP rating was mentioned before, 6K6. Uh, we just uh, use one coolant loop. Um, the inlet of the coolant has to be lower, uh, the inlet temperature of the coolant has to be lower than 60 degrees. The low voltage interface was defined for 25 and the control interface, Henrik has spoken about it, is based on J1939 with this specific uh, Stash, stash extension. So uh, we are approaching uh, the homologation uh, against R134, R100 and R10 right now, and everything was already passed successfully. So once again, here uh, a, sum, a summary of the most important facts of our FCM50. As mentioned, you know, uh, this FCSU software is really important uh, to run a module efficiently but also uh, made for a very long lifetime. This also deals then with the architecture you have chosen, like the low pressure cathode, using more cells within the module. Um, as far as I know, uh, we have a very high power density, considering uh, the dc so the functionality. I think it's also even the highest right now. And of course, um, due to the stash uh, program, uh, we we are able to, to, to offer our customers a standardized interface. So that is public available. And of course, if we do integration projects, uh, safety will be considered every time at every customer because every uh, application has different requirements. So here you see the interfaces of the FCM50. 
Um, of course, this is the, the box, the enclosure you can see. Here uh, at position number two, you find uh, the hydrogen monitor for the compartment for the box. Uh, here you got this ventilation out because you have to, to vent the stack module because it's, uh, yeah, it has external leakages which need to be diluted sufficiently. On four, uh, you got the connection to a, a, a coolant reservoir. On five, uh, you see the cooling in. Uh, cooling out can be uh, found in eight. Twelve is the hydrogen inlet. You see on position nine, the low voltage interface. Uh, and then 10, the high voltage interface. And yeah, this is uh, the exhaust line. And this is the air inlet. So all in all, um, um, we really try to, to comply to the standard. The A sample does not comply to the standard at all. So there was a, a big uh, influence from Stash from the A to the B sample. So especially the cutout, the position of the interfaces had to be adapted. And of course, also uh, the control interface had to be uh, updated. So on the next picture, uh, you see uh, the two applications. Uh, with the A sample built in. So this is uh, the first uh, hydrogen uh, truck of AH2 Hall uh, with in total right now just two A samples, which then will be replaced by four B samples. So then we can go up to 200 kilowatts. And there is also um, a prototype container at VDL Energy Systems where you can see our A sample, but this time in uh, vertical orientation. So uh, this is it. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, just uh, let me know. Yeah, thanks so much, uh, Werner. Um, so we have reached um, the end of the presentations regarding the content of uh, our project. Um, so Werner, if you can stop sharing, I will share with you the last uh, presentation that, uh, or um, the last presentation that is, uh, that we are to give. Okay, now let me do like this. So, um, so regarding our project, what are the next steps? So you have seen the explanation of the standard. You have seen uh, one fuel cell module supplier uh, giving their first um, uh, first uh, yeah module that is defined according to the standard. Um, so what are the next steps in our uh, our project? Um, so first of all, I would like you to know that uh, you know the standards is publicly available. You can download them on our website. And um, as I said, um, we are defining the final pieces of the standard towards the end of the project. So that means that it is currently open for review. And that means that uh, your comments and feedback are very welcome. Um, we are now in the first exploitation workshop of uh, STASH and uh, we uh, intend to keep you informed in a six to nine months period about the latest state of play of, uh, of the project. Um, and um, um, for example, one of the, the next um, workshops that we could uh, identify could be in which we let more um, fuels and module suppliers um, show their stash ready uh, or stash, apply, uh, uh, stash applied um, modules. Um, also, you are part of now the exploitation work group. That is our external body in which we are able to communicate this, the development of the, of, of the project. So we are going to further develop it. And uh, at a later phase, I will discuss with you also our um, next steps, uh, our project life after stash is over, um, which is called the post project exploitation plan. So um, having said that, we are now uh, coming to the end of uh, the recording of um, our uh, our workshop. That means that I'm going to stop the recording um, and then we go over to the Q&A session. Um, so um, if you st if you are seeing this um, uh, recording uh, at a later stage than uh, than live. Uh, any questions that you have can be forward to me or to Federico, um, and we are happy to take that uh, to take that up. So let me now stop um, stop the recording, and we move on to the Q and A.